All right, it's John Reed. I'm joined by the one and only. Yeah, I'm always introduced usually as the usual suspect. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, thanks for a different intro for John. Well, we are, I'm bloated from Tex Mex, so. <laughs> <laughs> Lightweight. Not thinking well. <laughs> uh, we've commandeered at an unusual location, but let's just get on to the matter at hand. We're in Atlanta, Georgia for IFS World, where you were just telling me record attendance, 1,500. And you, our job in this brief podcast, or relatively brief, is to make sense of this company and what they're doing. Right. For those who don't know, IFS is a uh, Scandinavian-based ERP vendor. Uh, they would tell you they probably sell heavily into the mid-market. They've got several strong verticals, one of which is like uh, aviation and defense. Um, they... Um, um, anyway, they've they've had quite a following in Europe, but now all of a sudden North America has become their biggest market, and I guess that's why we're here in uh, Hot Atlanta having Indeed. this uh, this event and event recap right now. Well, and it's interesting because you you heard a lot of what you would expect from you know ERP vendors in transition, right? You heard a lot of talk about futuristic stuff. Wait, Did, wait, wait, Alexa, tell me about yeah. IFS. We had actually a failed Alexa demo today, which was perfect. Yeah, uh, that, that, I think uh, I was tweeting about how about 90% of the uh, NLP, natural language processing demos that we see at shows, all bomb. Uh, so yeah. if anybody's, anybody listening to this is thinking they're going to be putting those things on their desktop at work anytime soon, <laughs> think again. So let's let's talk a little bit about this company and, and why listeners might find this company interesting because I, I think it's a it's an interesting player. Gr- granted, there's a lot of ERP companies trying to modernize and go through that transition. I think what's interesting about IFS is that in a certain sense, they're kind of futuristic in that They've had this rigorous focus on industry. I think that modern ERP is going to be much more industry oriented. And so in a certain sense, I think that focus has put them in an interesting and good position as we go forward. But there's major challenges because this is not a company you would describe as incredibly modern at this time when you would think about things like a platform-based architecture, for example, and loads of APIs. Some of that stuff is coming in the in in the in the ten release that they're that they're announced at, as of this conference. But there's some interesting contradictions between being really well thought on some of the industry side, but then on the modernization side, they have a lot of work to do, and I, and you might argue that their customers have even more work to do to keep up with them. Yeah, I mean, they've got, uh, obviously, they've got a very historical bunch of customers, many of which are from Europe, which hasn't necessarily been, uh, Western Europe hasn't necessarily been very fond of cloud technology adoption for a while. They still love their on-premise kind of uh, technology. Uh, You do have a lot of partners here, and they've been able to move a lot of customers into some single-tenant hosted uh, cloud-based solution version or versions, excuse me, on the product. But uh, to your modernization point, uh, you know, huge amount of discussion at the show about IoT and in particular and some artificial intelligence, natural language processing technologies. But where they really touted up the most is are in things like field service management, which is all going to be cloud based, uh, all mobile. Uh, very much driven off of, or needs to be driven by a lot of machine learning kind of technologies. And some of it has to be driven by a lot of IoT stuff where devices are basically phoning home uh, to the IFS application and requesting like a service tech come out and, you know, repair, refuel, restock, whatever a device. So it, in a way, what you've got is some of the modernization seems to be moving around the stuff to the periphery, you know, to the more cutting edge and skipping mm-hmm. some of the internal kind of structural things relative to the main part of the product. That's my assessment. Well, and you had a bit of a debate on Twitter with the CEO this morning. And <laughs> you I saw that. I, I give Darren Roos credit. He He's uh, uh, an ex-SAP type who is fired up to try to drive this company forward and you guys were debating around this notion of servitization because one of the big messages of the show that IFS has made to its customers is that manufacturing is becoming a commodity. It's being disrupted and the real revenue opportunities are in the service economy that comes after you ship something. And you were having some issues with that. You want to talk about that? 
Okay, so where Darren and I were tangling is uh, I've done a bunch of interviews lately with manufacturers, and uh, what I concluded were significant numbers of, let's say, tier one, tier two, tier three kind of manufacturers, and let's just pick a vertical like automotive. Uh, you know, if you make things like pl plastic trim parts for the inside of a car um, interior, you probably will never put a sensor ever on that and track the life of that piece of trim molding for the rest of its useful life. And what I discovered when I was doing all this research is that a huge number of manufacturers actually care more about uh, Industry 4.0 with regard and IoT with regard to how it impacts their internal manufacturing operations, stuff that goes on within the four walls of the company, not what's going to happen externally, which is where all the buzz is right now about, oh, Pete, we're slapping uh, sensors on all the products that we make and ship, and we're going to keep track of what's going on with them once they're out in the wild with the customers. Right. That's called servitization. And I think servitization actually is a smaller part of the IoT picture. The bigger story, the big full story is almost every manufacturer is going to need this stuff in their plants if they have any hope of bringing together some kind of factory of the future kind of capability for themselves. And so did you and Darren have a, any middle ground there? Because I think Darren was kind of saying that, that he thinks it's important to, to show that way forward. And I'm not sure maybe that they're quite ready on all the IoT stuff either. So that may be one reason why they're not emphasizing that quite as much. Well, both of those, both markets, either the IoT for inside the four walls the enterprise mm -hmm. announced, have different kinds of... Uh, let's say, technical needs, wants, and, you know, concerns. You know, I heard one analyst at lunch today uh, talking about how, you know, uh, if you're going to do IoT, like, within the four walls enterprise, you need to have, like, local servers and blah, 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 blah. You're not going to have, or pre-process, you're not going to put a bunch of this stuff up in the cloud. Well, actually, it turns out in the servitization world, everything needs to go to a cloud right. because you've got assets all over the planet and they may right. or may not, you know, they need some place to get that information bumped up to because they're not going to come back home to the enterprise in and of itself. Mm. I, actually, I think Darren and I were more arguing, let's say, philosophically as opposed to um, anything, you know, anything mm. more than that. But I do think the servitization deal is just one part of the bigger uh, IoT and manufacturing uh, discussion. Right. And then we look at where this company goes from here, and you have to think that they're going to probably shift gears in terms of their partner ecosystem because they really haven't relied much on partners in the past. And they viewed that as as key to some of the quality of their implementations. But as you go forward, that's going to have to change, right? Yeah, I think for a lot of companies, you have to make a decision about how aggressively am I going to grow and do I leverage channel partners or not to make that happen? Uh, yeah, there's, a, you know, I could, and I can see both arguments here. I, I know several SaaS vendors actually are trying to go back to taking back control of the implementations because of the very point you brought up about quality. Ceridian, for example, does, uh, an HR vendor does a lot of their own, if not almost all of their own implementations themselves for that exact purpose. But it, these guys have ambitions to scale. And if they want to grow, particularly in developing countries like, uh, uh, there's a huge market for a solution like this in both China and in India, and they're going to need to lean on partners, and they're going to need to find quality ones who can do a great implementation at scale and cheap. Right. One of the things that I just raised as a point is I don't see how they can possibly extend their vertical approach without opening up their platform to partners, and we've seen other ERP providers move in that direction because really you're not going to be able to develop that type of expertise for all the different verticals yourselves i mean you know even if you have a vertical like automotive or um which is one of the areas that they're pursuing as well as high-tech manufacturing and engineering you can slice and dice a lot of those in a micro vertical segments and if you don't have that some your competitor is going to get in there so you need a partner that knows that industry and has those relationships and how, how can you do that unless you open up your platform? So I think it's going to be interesting to see if they take those steps as well. And I think let's give Darren, he's only been on the job a little over a month. Now. Yeah. So let's give him, let's give him Another some month time so. to think. Yeah. <laughs> All right, think Darren, that, you got a month on that. that on that point. Yeah. Uh, but I would, I, um, 
I would tell you there was an interesting con uh, conflict with what you just described because there was a lot of discussion today about we want to take away the ability for like customers in particular to do a lot of brute force customization of the product they right. want you know the emphasis was clearly around using yeah. some of the tools to do tailoring and um that gets more interesting when you get into the areas like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms, and NLP stuff. Those things do require a lot of work, and they need to be open, transparent technologies, not opaque, closed-in black boxes. Right. Customers and partners will need to get into that, and we just we haven't they aren't ready for that conversation at this show right now today. Well, I think there's a big distinction right between what they were finding and what we heard from customers is customers are trying to move on from some of the over customization of the past. Correct. Um, and, and you're going to need that going forward because IFS doesn't want to be investing and in supporting customizations on all kinds of releases going back, you know, a decade or two. Now they need to focus on the, the modern stuff they're building. But I think to me, there's a huge difference between that type of customization and enabling partners to extend on your platform and build out stuff that's you know compliant with APIs and stuff like that, where it's not the same as as wrecking your code base. Yeah, um, you know, so it's a different scenario. But but for both of them, it's going to take a little while. I mean, I mean, one of the things that I think is really interesting, and coming back a year or two from now, will be really interesting to watch is with the announcement that they made of IFS 10. Right now, that's primarily beta customers who are in there, right? So Correct. how are they going to get the wide adoption on that? Because that's there's there's a major UX refresh there that is the, sort of the cornerstone for why they consider this like an optimal release for customers who want to be part of that you know factory of the future. They need to be on 10. Right now, only 35% of their customers are on 9. So they've got a bit of a pitch in terms of will customers respond to that pitch? Will customers say, yeah, we do need to modernize and we need you to do it for us? That's going to be their job, right? So I know I'll probably get grief for this, but I'm I'm a fervent believer that the best run software companies worry about the customers to come, not the customers they already have. Mm. And they're, you're right. They're going to need to create some kind of incentives, something that greases the skids to right. get some of these folks off of these older versions. And I'm sure a big reason for them being on the older versions was maybe the net new functionality going to, let's say, version 9 from 8 wasn't enough for them to justify a, yep. a, you know, a deal. But I think the bigger reason is a lot of folks did a bunch of uh, customizations either right. in or around those products, and they're going to have to move off of that. And uh, Darren at lunch today kind of uh, addressed that, uh, that he's not going to pry people's hands totally off the old products until they actually have a very viable way to make that happen. But it's clear mm -hmm. that's a priority for him because he wants to make more of the customers running in the cloud a big deal for next year. Right. So so when we look ahead a year, one of the big things is is have customers migrated to this new, re new 10 release and what progress there. The other piece of the progress will be net new, right? Because you were telling Correct. me that they've specified a net new target customer that's in a bit of a higher revenue range than a lot of their customers, right? Because their net new target is $500 million to $5 billion. Is that right? That's correct. That And that's Darren indicated. And while they have some big ones here, I mean, we saw Kyle Sarah was speaking in one right. group. And, um, you know, there are some big outfits here, multi-billion dollar companies, but they also have a, a l awful lot of them that are... Um, they're not small businesses. They're in the mid-size. And I guess I think he wants to move it up to the upper end of the mid-size market and the lower end of the large enterprise space. And if you're going to play in that market, back to your earlier point, tailoring and platform openness kind of things become, I think, even more important when you go to that, you go to that niche. And they've also beefed up their field service, and that's big on their service play they want to make. Yeah. And they've made some acquisitions that are kind of interesting, including a, 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 a pure SaaS, like in, in, in the proper term of pure SaaS, multi-tenant, small business uh, field service component that they've acquired. So, so they have some interesting acquisitions to sort through. Yeah, the acquired products actually, I think, are probably some of the most interesting. They've got this maintenance product, which is an yep. aviation preventive maintenance tool and maintenance tracking and scheduling technology. Uh, they've got WorkWave is the one I was referring to, which yep. is the field service yep. for small. That's a business. good one. And uh, usually, where they made the acquisitions, they've been um, 
They've ended up picking up gobs of customers and uh, a lot of new technology in with the mix. That's all goodness. I, I think the, um, again, I think the challenge is moving some of the core older customers, moving them into the present is going to be, uh, that's going to be a job that Darren's probably going to have to dedicate a couple of sharp execs into solving that problem. Yeah, probably our third metric for next year will be how much hair loss has Darren experienced over the course of <laughs> course of the year? Or has he been able to retain a full head? In which case, we'll know he's he's done well. Yeah, that or else we're going to see him switching entirely to Grecian formula. <laughs> we'll, we'll be on the lookout for that too. Indeed, and you know it, it's interesting because they're they're definitely. I think their best chance is that their own technology organization seems to get this stuff. I mean, the their CTO was talking about things like continuous delivery and agile development. So they understand internally what they have to do to push stuff out the door. But even if you're able to refresh your ERP system once a week, it doesn't mean your customers are ready for that. And I think that, in a yeah. nutshell, is where they're at. Yeah, I was. So. Uh, I'm- I'm trying to remember where it was, uh, but it was just last week. Some vendor was bragging about they have a release every single week. Right. And I'm like, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. That, that's got to really drive the customer. Hey, we're shipping nuts. the new General Ledger again. <laughs> Enjoy. Yeah. We think we've got all the fields sorted, but if not, you know, yeah, we, no worries. We've added a ninth way to allocate a balance in that General Ledger. Now, you're going to get really excited about that. All right. Well, Brian, next year I'm expecting better barbecue from you. Yeah, my but. apologies. Uh, John and I went, we went to one place and we, we'll save them uh, shame by not yeah. naming it. But I had a piece of brisket and I tweeted about it that I could have patched a blown out tire with and still gotten 5,000 more miles of, you know, of use out of it. I don't think Paul Hammerman would have wanted to see a photo of no, that. No, <laughs> that was uh, that was beyond the pale. But we redeemed ourselves yesterday with some great Tex-Mex, although wimpy John here can't handle that. No, I'm still digesting it now. So, <laughs> All right, I think that's good enough for this year. Thanks for listening. Thanks, everybody.